what he is facing as a U.S. president is unlike possibly what any other president has faced, the pandemic, a divided nation, an economy in trouble. It's as if to hear him talk, his entire political career has led to this moment. I, Kamala Davy Harris, do solemnly swear. I, Kamala Davy Harris, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. This land is your land. Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Office of President of the United States. Today, we celebrate the triumph not of a candidate. Been signing more than a dozen executive orders, one of them which greatly affects this country. It's going to rescind the presidential approval of the Keystone XL. We have lost a legend. Uh, Larry King has died. He was 87 years old. A part of the CNN family for so many years here. I mean, his career spanned six decades, and he spent 25 years with us here at CNN. He engaged new maker, newsmakers, as you know, around the world. Wolf Blitzer uh, takes a look at some of his most memorable interviews. He was the king of talk. Larry was the face of CNN. From presidents to professional athletes. You still face racism when you play? Music royalty. How do they tell you you're going to be a knight? To actual royalty movie stars to murderers. What's it like to kill someone? Heads of state What's to captains state of, of industry. Is that a logical expansion bill for Microsoft? <laughs> no one captured pop culture like Larry King on his iconic show. It was breaking news. It was long profiles. It was presidents. It was the most interesting show that we had. Interesting in part because King landed so many exclusives. Deep Throat himself. Mark Felt finally speaks. And got hard to get stars to open up. A good question can open up doors in my mind that, that, that I would never think of discussing with anybody. Larry King made news, broke news, and broke ground. Together for the first time ever on television, Jordan's King Hussein, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, and PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat talk about peace in the Middle East. In live TV, anything can happen. Feels like a leg. Okay, look at this. Remember this? Yes, brother! Only a lizard. And on Larry King Live, it certainly did. Goodbye. Goodbye. He got up close and personal in more than 50,000 interviews across a career spanning more than six decades. Not bad for a Jewish boy from Brooklyn, born in 1933. Back then, he was Lawrence Zeiger. My father died when I was nine and a half. I was on relief. For three years, I dreamed of being on the radio one day. That's all I ever dreamed of. That dream came true in the 1950s in Miami, Florida. New city, new job, and a new name, courtesy of his boss. He's got the Miami Herald open, and it was an ad for King's Wholesale Liquors. And he says, that's your name, Larry King. In the late 70s, King hosted a show airing coast to coast. Mutual Radio presents The Larry King Show. A national audience got to know King and his knack for lively conversation. What you want in an interview is a passion, a sense of humor, ability to explain what you do very well, and a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. Ted Turner came calling in 1985. He needed a new host for his fledgling cable news network. This is the premier edition of Larry King Live. I think we both put each other on the map. We made CNN because everyone started coming to that show. Among them, the leaders of the free world. I don't want to dwell on the Watergate thing. You might well have been reelected if you didn't pardon Richard Nixon. What are you proudest of? What is it like to be shot? Former CNN White House producer Wendy Walker oversaw King's show for 18 years. Larry talked to all the presidents. And I think they all felt very comfortable talking to him. Do you still like this job? Nobody knew if Larry was a Republican or a Democrat. He Hi, from Los Angeles, here's Larry King. After court wrapped up for the day, key figures in the trial headed to King's show night after night. We ended up knowing all the players from Johnny Cochran. A lawyer doesn't have to believe his client did or didn't do something, correct? 
to Marsha Clark. Did you say I am? We are fighting a losing battle here. You bet. We give you the glory this morning. Good morning and welcome to New Birth. We came to lift up the name Hallelujah. of Jesus. Yes, we want you to like, we want you to comment, and we want you to share that there's an experience of God about to happen. Hallelujah. Wake your family up. Let's worship together. I've got an announcement. We really serve a great God. He's an awesome God. He's a mighty God. I don't know where you are. Put your slippers on. Come on. Get out there in that living room. Get up and dance and shout and celebrate. It's time to worship Jesus. Water, if you turned into wine. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. Hey, it's none like you. Into the darkness, hey. Into the darkness, hey. you shine. Out of the ashes, we rise. Everybody say it. Out of the ashes, we rise. There's no one. It. You say it too. It's not like you say it. It's not like you. Let's raise it as a family. Come on. Our God is greater. Say. Our God is greater. Stronger. God, you are higher. God, you are higher. Than any other. Our God is a healer. He is awesome in power.
Everybody living and sing with me how great is our God.
incredible God we serve. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. I don't know how you feel about it, but he's been so good that I just can't keep it to myself. I know that we're in this new environment of virtual worship, but let's have a quick praise and worship testimony service. First, giving honor to God who is the head of my life. Yes, sir. And you take it from there. I want you to write your testimony right on the screen. What has he done for you this week? Has he put food on the table, clothes on your back, giving you reasonable health and strength? I want to hear your testimony. He's been so good that you can't keep it to yourself. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank him for saving me. I want you to drop that testimony right there. I want you to give God glory, praise, honor, and thanksgiving. I am a living witness that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. What a historic and monumental week that there was a successful transition and shift of power. Uh, we're so grateful unto God for this new administration, and we pray earnestly, deliberately, and intentionally uh, for our new president, who is, in fact, ratified and certified. Let there be no doubt uh, that Joseph R. Biden is the president of all the United States. And I'm telling you, I am beaming with enthusiasm uh, because I'm excited not just about him, uh, but y'all ought to be shouting for our new sister vice president, Kamala Harris, who is doing an amazing job already of modeling class distinction and diplomacy. I'm excited about what these next four years are going to look like. Already there is a rolling out an aggressive strategy to curtail COVID-19 uh, that has impacted our community in grievous ways. I want to ask that you would please be mindful uh, of the new edict that has gone forth over these 100 days, that you will please wear your mask, that you will continue wash your hands and that you will practice social distancing far too many people in our community have been impacted Jesus said I came that you might have life and not a regular one but I want you to have life more abundantly 400,000 people have died of COVID-19 400,000 people have died of COVID-19 uh, and there is in fact a, a cloud over Atlanta uh, because we lost one of our giants, lost one of our heroes, uh, lost one of uh, the pillars of our city. May, may I say, uh, not just uh, our city, our community, and uh, the world. Henry Hank Aaron, known as the Hammer. Uh, he broke Babe Ruth's record. And I want to tell you, for 23 seasons, he always had home runs beyond anybody else. I'm thankful between Milwaukee and Atlanta, there was not a more distinguished gentleman than Hank Aaron. A interviewer by the name of Larry King, who also passed this week, asked him, what is the secret to your success? And Hank Aaron said, to always keep swinging. And I think that's our responsibility. No matter what is thrown at you by life, you just got to keep swinging. No matter what physical challenges, what financial challenges, no matter what's happening in your family, what's going on in your job, what's going on in your mind, you got one responsibility, and that's to keep swinging. I'm telling you, as long as you stand, stuff is going to be thrown at you. Uh, but I'm telling you, if God be for you, who can be against you? I watched as millions of you did the inauguration of our new administration on this week. And I'm telling you, I just jumped on top of my bed doing somersaults when I saw this brilliant black sister by the name of Amanda Gorman walk to the stage and she spoke so eloquently and clearly. I said, I've got to hear that again. And so I want to pause in the middle of our worship to hear our nation's youngest poet laureate bring light, life, and liberty to a nation through language. 
won't you please peer in and hear what Fannie Lou Hamer dreamed about to be young, gifted, and black. Amanda Gorman. Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace in the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter. Amanda Gorman, a name that you're going to have to remember. I want you to pull your young people in. She's just a recent graduate of Harvard University at 22 years of age. I'm excited. At the end of our worship experience, I've got an amazing announcement for you and for your young people, your grandchildren that need to be plugged in. I'm grateful for emerging generations. Pastor Carrie Turner has an amazing program that we want to roll out at the end of this service and I don't want you to miss it. I don't want your children to miss it. I don't want your future to miss it. One of the unsung heroes of the, the inauguration was an incredible gentleman by the name of Eugene Goodman. We were introduced to him on January 6th when there was an insurgence at the uh, U.S. Capitol. 
where there were rioters, looters, might I say, led by the Proud Boys and others who were trying to topple our government and dismantle our Constitution. But one brave security brother by the name of Eugene Goodman redirected the mob so that they would not be able to go into the seat of power. There were those who saw it and thought that he was acting in cowardice, not realizing he had a strategy and a plan, having served three tours of duty, nobly, honorably, for our military. As a consequence, when there was a changing of the guard, he has, in fact, been put into a critical place of power and influence because he can be trusted. We saw him at the inauguration that he escorted our new Madam Vice President down into the galley where she could, in fact, take in that oath of office. My dear friends, one of my dear Morehouse brothers, Pastor E. Dewey Smith, uh, down the street, he often would say, if you stay small enough, long enough, you'll be big enough soon enough. I want to give that to you again. If you stay small enough, long enough, you will be big enough soon enough. I got to give it to you one last time. You ought to write that on the screen. If you stay small enough, long enough, you're going to get big enough soon enough. And that's what's going to happen for so many of you that can hear my voice is that God is getting ready to bless you because you've had the heart of a servant. Because you led even when people didn't understand. You made sacrifices when people made a mockery. You did what was uncomfortable and inconvenient when it would have been easier to take a lesser route. But this is the season God is going to shift you from the back of the line to the front of the line. I learned this week in the midst of study that now the largest landowner in America, you're not going to believe it, the largest landowner in America is now Bill Gates, largest landowner. We know him through technology, but he is shifting his economic portfolio. He now owns here in the continental United States 240 million acres of land. He says that he is doing it, here it is, because he wants to be able to control and influence what people eat. And as a consequence, he is trying to put patents, I need you to buckle this up, on seeds. If he can put a patent on seeds, how much grain, how much green, how much produce will now have to come through him. Why? Because he understands the power of a seed. I wonder how many of you are going to be lost out of the equation, will be missing from the dialogue because you don't know the power and the influence of your seed. It looks small, but it has influence. Doesn't seem like it's much, but it will dictate what the people in your family will eat. It can be easily dismissed, but if it is planted right, generations behind you will eat for a long time. Native American proverb says, if you give somebody a fish, they'll eat that day. If you show them how to fish, they'll eat for many days. And then somebody came and remixed and said, don't teach me how to fish, show me how to buy the lake. That's where it is that you've got to be in your positioning of apostolic authority is I want to make sure that those that come behind me will never be in lack, will never be an insufficiency. Can you imagine that a technological titan is now shifting to the original job of humankind, which is farming? I want you, every single one of you, I want you to get your seed in your hand. Not just you, I want your children to do it. I want you to get your spouse to do it, your significant others, those who are in your sphere of influence. Come on, y'all. We have got to plant a seed so we know no matter what happens in this economy, no matter what happens in the stock market, no matter what happens with politics, we're always going to eat. Why? Because I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. 
I want you to get your seed. What are you asking for on today, Pastor? I'm asking you uh, to sow your seed of your obedience, your reasonable sacrifice of your tithe. All of the prompts are below me, even in this moment, whether you're giving through GiveLify, PushPay, text to give if you're mailing it, I want you to please seal that envelope. But I want you to make sure you got a seed in the ground. I had no idea that my Morehouse brother, when he made that declaration, was talking to the seed and not to me. That if you stay small enough, long enough, you will be big enough soon enough. When you plant that seed in the ground, I'm telling you, it's always going to be bigger than the seed. Can you imagine that a watermelon got to look back at that seed and say, is that what I used to look like? Turnips got to look back at that seed and say, is that where I began? Some 20, some 40, some 60, some 80. But I believe for those of you who are grasping this word that there's going to be a 100-fold increase for your life. If you have faith, here it is, the size of a mustard seed, you can tell mountains to get out of your way. Come on, would you, so even in this moment, would you challenge yourself? It's a new dawn in America. It's a new day for your family. It's a new page for your children. And let's seal it with a seed. A seed of thanksgiving. A seed of expectation. I'm challenging you to do it. I want you to do it. There's a word that God has in fact barreled deep in my soul that I can't wait for you to harvest. This word is going to change your thinking. It's going to change your thinking. It's going to change your thinking. And then it's going to change your life. I want you to sow that seed even while we're uh, in this moment. Our music ministry is going to prepare our hearts for the word of God. When they would have concluded, I want you to meet me in the book of Genesis. That's the word that God has given me for you on this day. We only have two Sundays left for this series. I'm working on something. And those of you who are working on something, I'm telling you, get ready to roll up your sleeves. Get a notebook. Find, in fact, the page on your apparatus, on your device that allows you to take notes because there's some things that I want to give you that's going to illuminate your conscience and invigorate your spirit. I'm excited. Why? Because you got a seed in the ground and it's almost harvest time. Stay tuned and hear what God has for your life. I can hear the Lord Saying I'm aware And I've heard your prayer No matter how you feel Know that I am still in control you are it's in the room everybody say whatever you need hey whatever you need i don't know what it is but whatever whatever you need whatever you need, whatever you need. it's in the room everybody say it cuz he's working it out whatever
control. That's what God is saying. Know that I, I am here wherever you're here is. Whatever me healing and whatever me miracle and whatever me it's in your room. working it out. Whatever you need, he's turning it around. Whatever you need, it's in the home. Whatever you need, you need. Hey, whatever. Whatever it is that you need from God, I want you to type it on that screen. I need healing. I need a job. I can't hear anybody. I need somewhere to live. I need reconciliation of my marriage. Whatever you need, I want you to type it even right now. Come on, just one more time. It's in the room. Come on, you're not writing nothing. You're not typing it. Come on. desperately need you to get your Bibles and join me immediately at Genesis chapter 2. I don't want you to pause, hesitate, or deliberate. I need you. I'm telling you, I need you to go to Genesis chapter 2. I want you to please uh, get this word today. I want you to text somebody. I want you to tag somebody. I want you to tell somebody there is a word from the Lord you can get it from new birth right now. Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. Here's what it reads. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pashan. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The fourth river is the Euphrates. I want to preach for a little while today with your prayers, but more importantly with God's presence, using as a subject, one more river to cross. I got one more river to cross. Before you even understand it, would you just write that 
in uh, the chat room. I've got one more river to cross. Lord, speak. Your servants are hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. One more river to cross. Might I um, suggest to you humbly that being strapped for cash causes a lot of stress. Being strapped for cash causes a lot of stress. The threat of losing great sums of money can be nauseating. All the more feeling like somebody is making off with your money can be infuriating. I was engulfed in grief when it was reported that music mogul Dr. Dre had been rushed to the emergency room due to a brain aneurysm. With an athletic frame and a picture of health, it didn't match that he would be in such a vulnerable position. Until then, it was uh, revealed that he's in the middle of a contentious divorce. After 24 years of marriage, a billion-dollar estate is at stake. A billion dollar estate is at stake. His estranged wife has uh, just been awarded a two million dollar a month maintenance fee. Two million dollars a month maintenance fee. I pondered how this young man who came through the concrete of Compton somehow or another was uh, able to amass so much just from making music. Only to discover that the bulk of his wealth did not come from music but from co-founding Beats Electronics which makes headphones. In 2014, Apple made its largest acquisition to date. So at the end of the day, he's fighting over resources, and I need you to hear me intently. He's fighting over resources that his gift didn't create, but his brand helped to cultivate. Just miss that. He's fighting over resources that his gift did not create, but his brand helped to cultivate. One of the largest hip-hop pioneers who happened not to be produced by Dr. Dre, hailing from the opposite coast, is Nas. His breakthrough album, Illmatic, changed the course of hip-hop. His last chart-topping album was back in 2012. But meanwhile, he's launched a firm called Queens Bridge Venture. Queens Bridge Venture. And Queens Bridge Venture invests in 20 companies a year. And those 20 companies that he invests in a year, he does an investment between 100,000 and a half million. 20 of them. 20 emerging entrepreneurial ideas. He finds 20 of them, and every year he gives 20 of them 100,000 to 500,000. Being an early investor, helped him make substantial profits because what many people don't know is this Brooklyn-based rapper was one of the original investors for Lyft, one of the original investors for Dropbox. His highest yielding return came from Ring, the security alarm company that is touted by Amazon. 
He profited $40 million, hear this, off of a doorbell. Somehow or another, he made another lucrative investment into Pluto TV, which is a streaming service that earned Nas $340 million. Did you hear what I just said? Earned him $340 million. And in Lyft, Dropbox, Ring, Pluto TV, for none of them does he rap. Somehow or another, has been able to do well without using his gift. It should be known that the world's wealthiest museum, musician, the world's wealthiest musician is my daughter's favorite, Rihanna, who is worth, hear this, $600 million. $600 million. She launched her Fenty Beauty line, which made her, and I need you to hear this, I need you to pull your daughters close to the screen, it made her $72 million the first month. The first month she made $72 million. Can you imagine? Her friends telling her, don't go in the makeup, it's too many people doing it. That you can't compete with Mac. That there's no way in the world you're going to be able to get to the counter. After that first month, you ain't going to believe it. She uh, con came into a covenant uh, with a luxury conglomerate that owns Louis Vuitton. And as a consequence, according to Forbes magazine, that makeup company is now worth $3 billion. Sent an article to uh, our Minister of Music, Jonathan Nelson, a couple of weeks ago, uh, showing him an outlined list that the 20 wealthiest black musicians don't make their money from music. I got to give that to you again. The 20 wealthiest black musicians do not make their money from music. Pastor, what are you telling me? I'm trying to tell you that maybe the church was wrong because they have had people prostituting their gift, thinking their gift is the only way they could make money and didn't realize what makes you money is not your gift but your character, that your name is what is going to generate your income. He said through scripture, I will make your name great. You're not going to like this. He never said, I'm going to make your career great. What will you do if in the year of our Lord, 2021, that the Lord has you to do amazing things, but it doesn't match your passion? What if God called you to do some things that doesn't line up with your talent, your training, or your degree? Maybe he needed you to use your gift just so you could get a name. And then after you get a name, he's able to do some things that you didn't even see coming. Curtis Jackson, known as 50 Cents, said, I had to figure out how to make money when I don't work. He said, when I was doing it the wrong way, I only got paid when I was on the stage. But when I learned how to do it the right way, even when I'm not on stage, I'm still receiving checks. I wish I was preaching to somebody today. I am believing for you as I believe for myself, as I believe for my family, as I believe for my children, that God in this hour is going to open up multiple streams of income. Your faith doesn't resonate with it, so let me say it to somebody behind you. God is getting ready to engineer the circumstances of your life for four streams of income. I need those of you that just received that prophetic word over your life. I need you to just put four in the chat room. God is getting ready to bless you with four streams 
of income. Y'all still not awake. I'm in Genesis chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 2, we get an on-the-ground tour of the Garden of Eden. Where outside of man, God's greatest cornerstone of creation is the Garden of Eden. And I want you to look at Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to peer in to verse number 5 and watch what happens in verse number 5. I never paid attention to it until this week. In verse number 5, it says, There are no shrubs, there are no plants, there are no bushes, and there is no grass. That's in verse number 5 in Genesis chapter 2. No shrubs, no plants, no bushes, no grass. That's what verse number 5 says. And then it adds, because it has not rained yet. God help me. There's some stuff in the elements, in the atmosphere, but it won't come forth until it's dealt with some rain. New edition, Boston native says, everybody loves sunny days, but can you stand the rain? That the rain is necessary for some stuff to grow. The storm is necessary for you to develop and cultivate what's around you, but has not flourished yet. He says to Adam, you are to take dominion and authority over the earth. And everybody pays attention to the creeping things, to the crawling things, to the flying things. But nobody has paid attention that in the Garden of Eden that God carved and etched out four streams. And I'm speaking to every man, every woman of God. You maybe have been overlooking your stream. You've been paying so much attention to beast that you don't even realize when there's water right in front of you. Isn't it amazing that he named everything but forgot to name his stream? This is the hour that God is going to give you authority to name your four streams. Verse number 10 in Genesis chapter 2, it disclosed, it disclosed that a river watering the Garden of Eden is splintered in the four smaller streams. The name of the first river, this is going to help you later on. I need you to write it down. The name of the first river is Pishon, P-I-S-H-O-N. And Pishon, hear this, translates to mean increase. That's the first stream I find in the Garden of Eden is increase. And I need you to hear this. Gold is found in it. Many of you don't even realize you got a solid gold idea, but you scared to get in the water. Isn't it amazing how many of you won't uh, go swimming because you're scared of getting your hair wet. But that's where the gold is. Where the gold is, hear this, is where it compromises how you look. <laughs> you just missed that. Where the gold is compromises your appearance. Can't get in the water and your mascara not run. And your hair not get frizzy. And your clothes start sticking to you. Can you follow the idea if the idea God has given you doesn't allow you to be cute? Can you trust God in the water when you got to tread in it and you can't uh, take selfies while you're doing it? Can you trust God if your gold idea in the water makes you to pan all day? And you don't know what it is that you're going to pull out of it, but it's going to be better than what you had while standing on safety and dry ground. But in that first stream, here it is. Not only do you find gold, but you find onyx. Blocked black stone. And onyx, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, hear this. Onyx has healing properties. So onyx promotes vigor. Onyx uh, 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 unleashes stamina. 
Onyx imparts self-confidence. Onyx banishes grief. It enhances self-control and stimulates the power of wise decisions. So maybe we've got evidence that uh, Adam nor Eve ever got into the first stream of Pashan because they never learned how to make wise decisions. So the first river that God put you in is to help you with your choices. It's to help you, in the words of Hank Aaron, to keep swinging. Gives you the vim, vigor, and vitality to find your strength without taking Red Bull, without gulping Mountain Dew. Have you gone deep enough in the stream that you don't care what you look like, but you understand, huh? I got to do what I got to do until I can do what I want to do. The second river is Gihon, G-I-H-O-N. Gihon, G-I-H-O-N. And Gihon translates to mean bursting forth. Isaiah 58 and 8 in the English Standard Version says, And your healing shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Bursting forth. And what is bursting forth, I need you to hear this, is healing. Uh, so, so many of you all are uh, uh, saved and doing the bus it challenge. He said, I ain't looking for you to bust it. I'm looking for you to burst through. I need healing to happen, hear this, in your mental space. I need those of you that will. I want you to lay hands on your head. Because I am believing that God is going to transform you by the renewing of your mind. I'm believing you're going to be healed from the trauma you endured at 12, at 20, at 32. I am believing healing is bursting forth for that relative that's in a hospital bed, for that loved one who's in a nursing home. For the one that's in the bedroom down the hall, healing is about to burst forth. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon his shoulders, and by his stripes I speak healing. To every person that's got affliction in their body. Every person that's being taunted in their sleep. Every person that's being stalked in their thoughts. I speak healing that's bursting forth. So in that first river, I've got to be immersed enough to get uh, wet in good decisions, in vigor and vitality. In that second one, healing has got to happen at the end of my life. In the third river, is the Tigris River. And Tigris, T-I-G-R-I-S, Tigris translates to mean rapid speed. <laughs> Lord, come quickly with all your quickening power. I need somebody in this studio, somebody at home to shout out loud, hey up God. I, I, I don't know whether you need God to do something for you, but I need God to do something quickly. It's what Shakespeare calls majestic instancy. I, I need it to happen before I can ask for it. I need God to do it before I can put on shoes. Somebody shout out loud, hey, I'm God. God, I need you to do it quickly. Hallelujah. I need you to do it faster than what my lawyer can. I need you to do it faster than what the banker can. I need you to do it speedier than what my supervisor can. I need just 500 people to shout out loud, Hey up, God! Hey up, God, and shrink that tumor in my body. 
Hurry up, God, and get me the contract that I need. Hurry up, God, and let me close on this house. Hurry up, God, and give me the credits I need to graduate. Hurry up, God, and open up the door so I can leave the job I can't stand. Hurry up, God, and silence all of my enemies and my critics. Hurry up, God. Light travels. Light travels. Hear this. Light travels 186,000 miles per second. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, light travels 186,000 miles a second. I got to give it to you one last time. Light travels 186,000 miles a second. And then Jesus says, I am the light. <laughs> do, do you know how fast God is moving on your behalf while you blink your eye? God changed somebody's blood pressure. While you blinked your eye, God stopped somebody's eviction. While you blinked your eye, God gave somebody the increase that they needed. I'm thankful under God that that's how fast your miracle is coming. That's how fast your deliverance is coming. That's how fast your miracle deliverance and breakthrough is coming. He said, I'm coming at the speed of life. Jump in the water. That's your third stream. Ladies and gentlemen, my time has quickly elapsed. We've already treaded, hallelujah, in Pishon. We've already dived into Gihon. We've done the backstroke in the Tigris. And now we only got one more river to cross. Hallelujah. You got your strength in Pishon? Huh. You were able to burst forth in Gihon. You found your speed in Tigris. And now you only got one more river to cross. The last river you have to cross is the Euphrates. It's your last river. And the Euphrates translates to mean fruitful and multiply. Isn't it amazing? Kyle, you ain't going to believe it. Isn't it amazing? That Eve never had kids till she got put out. God help me. What, what, what did you just say, Pastor? <laughs> Eve was never fruitful until she fell. She never gave birth until she was put out of her safe place. She was never able to multiply until she messed up. And where it is that she messed up is the same place God helped her to multiply. I want you to know with everything you've gone through in COVID-19, God's been baptizing you. He had to help you to get your strength. He immersed you because he had to help you make some better decisions. He subdued you in the water because he needed you to go through some things fast. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades of the faith, this is your last river. What you are getting ready to jump into next is the thing that's going to multiply you, is the thing that's going to make you fruitful, is the thing that's going to make you explode, is going to make you walk into your wealthy place. But I had to make you go through the other three first. To see if you would drown before you learned how to swim. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I am, as, I am, as you very well know, I am a, a graduate of Morehouse College and, and Benjamin Mays instituted something that I, I uh, hate and I, I don't even know if I've ever told this story before, but uh, before you can graduate from Morehouse, it's not a Latin requirement, not a Greek requirement. Um, for you can graduate from Morehouse, you've got to jump from a 40-foot uh, diving board and swim across. You got four years to do it. Because Dr. Mays was of the mind, 
that you can't be a black man and read and not know how to swim. But in order for you to know how to swim, you got to learn how to appropriately fall. And when you appropriately fall and then can get to the other place, you are then ready to graduate. You will be amazed. How many brothers at Morehouse? It took them four years just to take that climb up that ladder. You'd be amazed how many went to the edge of the diving board. Looked down and said, I can't do this. I'm going to do it another time. I'm going to do it another year. You'd be amazed how many delayed their promotion because they didn't want to dive. How many people never got to the finish line because they didn't want to jump? I want to say to somebody who can hear my voice, this is your last river. All you got to do is jump in it and say, God, I'm scared to death. I don't know where the folk going to laugh at me. I never did it like this before. And God said, do you trust me? Do you trust me for your last dive? Do, do you trust me? I know you failed before, but do you believe this is going to work? And I'm believing I got some real swimmers who are watching me today who don't even know that swimming is not the requirement. Diving is. Jump into your last river. God, if this is what you're calling me to do, if this is the last prerequisite for my elevation, if this is what you want me to do while other people are watching, I'm going right to the edge. And I'm going to jump into this idea. I'm going to jump into this dream. I'm going to jump into this assignment. I'm going to jump into this call. And God, I trust you. Because you brought me through the last three and you didn't let me drown, but you let me swim through it. I don't know where you are, but I believe God is calling you to now this fourth stream. And those of you who are equipped and positioned to make the greatest dive of your life, while you're at home, while you're in the living room, while you're sitting up in your bed, lift up that hand, divers. You're going down only to come back up again. Lift up that hand, divers. This is your last river you got to cross before you get into your wealthy place. Lift up that hand, diver. It took you to go through all of this just to get to this moment. God, I pray for every person who's got one last river to cross. They're stepping out of gift and walking in the trust. I'm talking to those who understand in the words of John Maxwell that talent is not enough. That my integrity means something. My character should be able to open doors. That my name will be sufficient. And the only reason why my name is good is because I hide my name behind his name. And there is a name above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. I speak over your life. Increase, multiplication, fruitfulness, abundance, overflow, more than enough. And those of you, your faith comes into agreement with my faith. I dare you to celebrate your last river. I dare you to thank God for the stream that God is opening. It's going to make more for you than the last three jobs you had. How many of you believe, God, my next venture is going to shift life as I know it? I need you to have it. I need you to buy into it. And I need you to dive in it. Come on. I don't want you playing footsie with it. I need you to dive into this idea. Give it everything you got that I cannot drown. Because if God be for me, who can be against me?
I want you to be a part of a ministry of high divers. People who took a risk with God. People that had to trust God. People that didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But we believed him for it anyway. All you got to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you shall be saved. Can I give it to you again? Four streams of income. And the fourth one is the hardest one. Four streams of income. It's going to require your faith. It's going to require your attention. It's going to require your complete submission. Four streams of income. I want you to become a part of our new birth family by way of uh, the prompts that are beneath me now. I want you to become a part of a congregation of entrepreneurs, a congregation of outliers, a congregation of dreamers, a congregation of risk takers, a congregation of survivors. Can I say this? A congregation of people who didn't know how to swim but learned how to dive and take the swim of their life. I know it's high risk for you to join a church in this season. Can't even shake your pastor's hand. Can't turn to your neighbor, but take the dive. This is where God wants you. This is where I'm believing that God is gonna take you. That the rest of your life is gonna be the best of your life. I gotta tell you this. I'm excited our Emerging Generations Department under the leadership of Pastor Kerry Turner we partnered with an organization called Goal Setters. Goal Setters, we are in fact taking under our wing. I need you to hear me well. I need you to pull your young people to the screen. We're doing financial literacy training for 100 young people from 6th to 12th grade. From 6th to 12th grade, we are adopting young people into entrepreneurship. Here it is, into wealth creation and into financial literacy. These 100 young people, we're gonna be opening up savings accounts for them. It doesn't matter what uh, economic background they come in. Every week, they're gonna be sent email assignments as to what it is that they're going to do. They're gonna be sent cards so that they can track their spending, their investing, and the interest that is connected to it. Six to 12th grade. I need you, if you want your child to be a part of that program, I only have slots for 100, the first 100 that respond. I need you to send us an email at emerginggenerations at newbirth.org. Emerginggenerations at newbirth.org. Emerginggenerations at newbirth.org. I need their name. I need their age. I need their grade. And I need you to insert a picture. I need their name. I need their age, I need their grade, and I need you to insert a picture. Even if you have multiple children in the household, and can I tell you the good news, they do not have to live in Atlanta. No matter where it is that they are, between 6th and 12th grade, we are running a pilot program of financial literacy, 6th to 12th grade. I need you to send us that email because we're shutting it off as soon as we get to 100 emerging generations at newbirth.org. Here's what I need you to do. Those of you who are empty nesters, those of you, your children are already fully steeped in the knowledge of financial literacy. I want you to adopt one of these 100 young people. Here's all that is needed is all that is needed is very small, it's very easy. Here's what I need you to do. I need a hundred of you to give a seed of $40. One hundred of you, one of you can just write a check for 4,000 and can you believe that is the sum total of the entire registration of the program? $40 per child and it's a hundred of them. You are going to be uh, connected to online banking, these young people are. They're going to be monitoring how it is that they evolve and develop in financial literacy. I don't know how you ain't just jumping out of your seat. Can you imagine where you would be if you had this kind of information in the eighth grade? You had this kind of information in the ninth grade. You had this kind of information before you got to college. It is mind-blowing how easy you can get a credit card when you go to college, but how hard it is to get a loan when you get out of college. 
because it is a trap for debt. How do we equip our young people? When the lead source of debt in this country is not credit cards but student loans, how do we equip our young people? It's part of the responsibility of the church and part of the burden and the mantle of new birth. I only have 100 spots. Once it is that we reach 100, we're shutting it down until the next rollout for our young people. They've got to be between 6 and 12. They've got to be 6 and 12th grade. They've got to be under 18 years of age. It doesn't matter where they are in the continental United States. Email us emerginggenerations at newbirth.org. But in the interim, I need 100 of you who will sponsor one of our young people. The giving, my way to do that, is below me even right now. All of our giving prompts are available to you. I am praying for you that not just you, your children, your family, your last name will have four streams of income. Take a dive. Trust God. Would you stay tuned? We've got announcements that we want to share with you that are going to bless your life and enrich your family. For your video announcements. Our February Book of the Month, Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson, is available in the Call to Conquer bookstore. It's a revolutionary new way to see and shape love relationships. It'll make a great addition to your library. Stop by Call to Conquer Saturdays from 8 a.m. until 1 p.m. or visit calltoconquer.com. Hey family, it's Pastor Carrie here, pastor of Emerging Generations, and I am thrilled to come before you with a huge announcement. Listen, on behalf of our senior pastor, Dr. Jamal H. Bryant, I want you to know that New Birth invests. Yes, New Birth is looking for 100 youth and young adults for us to invest in. Listen, if you are of the ages of 8 to 24, we have something huge that we're about to do for you. We can't tell you what the secret is until we go live on Fifth Sunday, but we want want you to go ahead and register for it right now because I can already tell you the spots are going to go fast and we only have 100 of them. I want you to email me your name, your age, your photograph to emerginggenerations.org. You can literally do that right now. It will take you 60 seconds to do. Send me that information via email. We're going to follow up with you to let you know that you are one of the 100 and we have something huge that we are getting ready to invest. Don't miss this opportunity to be one of the 100. Also, Emerging Generations is now accepting scholarship applications. The submission deadline is Thursday, April 15th. Also, EG is hosting a scholarship application orientation Wednesday, January 27th, 6.30 p.m. Just visit newbirth.org slash events to download the scholarship application and for more information. Oh, but EG's not done. Emerging Generations wants to hear from you. You're invited to participate in a focus group Thursday, January 28th. Visit newbirth.org slash events for more information or to register, send an email to dtyler at newbirth.org. And in just two weeks, King's Table will be back. So if you need groceries, come by Saturday, February 6th. Please contact the Atlanta Community Food Bank to find a food pantry in your area if you need groceries now. Or text Find Food to 888-976-2232. And that's it for our video announcements. What he is facing as a U.S. president is unlike possibly what any other president has faced, the pandemic, a divided nation, an economy in trouble. It's as if 